I think it is there. It will work. And if it doesn't work, then without presentation, we'll have it. Okay, okay. So if you want, if you uh, have a presentation, so in the present now section, you can share your full screen, entire screen, screen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and then you can start. Not the window. Not the window. Sir, so it will be better if you want. So, for the for uh, your presentation, your entire full screen is a better option. Okay. So, what is the difference between window and? Uh, sir, if you are checking, but sir, there is no difference. But for uh, presentations, it is correct. Otherwise, if you are one tab or window, then it is like online. If you are sharing something, so that gives a better option. Now, the funny thing uh, with the Google, Google Meet is. Uh, funny thing with Google Meet is, I mean, once the presentation is there, I can't see all of you. <laughs> so uh, I'll be just uh, speaking with the, my laptop. Yes, sir. Yes, so, right. yeah. so if you want, uh, like, uh, if you want, and if you want to send it to me, I I will be share. I can share the presentation. No, I can see it is there. I can okay. see. Yeah, it is fine. Shall we start now? I think yes. Let us formally welcome Professor Sharma and introduce him to our participants, Neha. Yes, ma'am. And welcome to Indraprastha College, Professor Sharma. We are really honored to have you. Yes, we are. This is the first time you have come. You have always been there, but we welcome you once again. Yes, over to you, Neha. Thank you. So a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today I would like to welcome the speaker of. Today's session, Professor Radheshyam Sharma, Coordinator, Center for Earth Studies, Dr. Anandita Roy Saha, all the faculty members present here and the participants in this lecture session organized under the theme Environmental Pollution. On behalf of Department of Environmental Studies and IP community, I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Radheshyam Sharma for agreeing to deliver a talk in this session. It is my privilege, sir, to introduce you to all the participants and the faculty members present here. Professor Radheshyam Sharma is serving as a professor at the Department of Environmental Studies, University of Delhi. His research interests include understanding the ecology of abandoned mines and other contaminated sites for the development of ecological restoration and bioremediation biotechnologies. His specialization includes soil, soil microbiology, plant microbe interactions, phytoremediation, which is a type of bioremediation, and environmental biotechnology. He has published several papers in journals of international repute, such as Nature, Scientific Data, Soil Biology and Biochemistry, Journal of Hazardous Materials, Journal of Environmental Management and Environmental Research. He has been teaching postgraduate students and guiding PhD scholars on different aspects of environment and ecology, particularly ecotoxicology and environmental health and environmental biotechnology at the University of Delhi. He has also been engaged in imparting training and capacity building among university teachers, postdoctoral and doctoral research scholars through the organization of workshops and training programs. Once again, I would like to thank you, sir, for accepting our invite. And now over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks again to all the organizers, principal ma'am, Dr. Anidata Saraya, 
and my young colleagues, uh, Dr. Neha and Dr. Naveen, and all the participants. So inviting me to share my views on such an important topic and how the soil health affects the quality of life and how we can restore it. So this is one, one of the important topics. I think in the, this program has been formulated very well where all the components of the environment have been reflected and how are they being affected and how we are shaping those uh, environmental compartments and how in return the feedback loop, how those environment is shaping our uh, social health, economic health, and as well as the sustainability of a nation. I think the, this is one of the uh, unique program which I could see in recent past. So I must congratulate all the organizers for um, planning and uh, designing a course which is very meaningful um, for all the students as well as the research scholars and teachers. So thank you very much once again. So uh, now we'll continue our discussion on uh, the soil health and how it affects uh, the quality of life. See, if you remember, there is one of, my, one of the important quote, and uh, you must have heard several times earlier in the past also, uh, that how uh, the soil is important. A nation which destroy its soil, destroy itself. Let me tell you. And this is very clear, and we have been watching it, because you know that how the different civilization evolves. The, the prime factor and the foundation of development of all civilization was the healthy soils and healthy water. And what we have done in recent past is, we have destroyed the very foundation of our uh, civilization. That's why we are suffering, let me tell you. That's a major challenge. If, even if you look at the economic prosperity in, across the nation, you may see in the economic indicators are quite strong, of course, uh, not, not in the pandemic time. But otherwise, uh, in, if you look at the 2019 data, so you, you could see that the economic indicators are quite strong, including India. But at the same time, the quality of life is, is a, is a, and, and the social well-being is a challenge still. So economic indicators are not enough. That is because we have focused more on economic development, and that, which is very important, no doubt, for the development of any nation. But we have compromised with the health of soil and water. So that's why the concept of sustainable development in, has come. So why we can't adopt a model which can be more sustainable, where we can ensure our uh, conservation of our soil, water, and air. At the same time, we can also ensure the development, and which is called sustainable development. If we look at the, I, I thought we'll, I'll just look, uh, look back for the past 20 years, what has happened in the past, in, in two decades. So if you look at the uh, 1999 and 2020, I, I try to correlate. There are many things which has happened in the past, no doubt, in the past two decades. But I'm focusing on some of the important challenge for human health. Because right now we are in the pandemic and we are not able to meet physically. So you can understand very well that how the, the environmental health and the spread of such kind of epidemics and pandemic has challenged the, what is it, the economic growth of any nation or even the whole world. If you look at the past two decades, there are many disease, epidemics and pandemics, and they, they are common. Let me tell you, you could witness whether they're in the Asian region or American region or in France or in some uh, developing nation you could see that there are many diseases which have become very common now, these epidemics and pandemics, like, for example, anthrax, H1N1, chikungunya, chickenpox, COVID-19, where we are still in the COVID-19, and then dengue, diphtheria, Ebola, H1N1, hantavirus, and hurricane uh, Mitch disease, lesser fever, measles, mars -CoV, and then there are microcephaly, monkeypox, and SARS, and uh, typhoid, and yellow fever, and Zika virus. You can see, let me tell you, these across the nation, there is a record. In the past 20 years, we, the whole world, has witnessed so many disease, epidemic, as well as some kind of local pandemic and so on. So the, the, such kind of disease have become common. Although we could control what is known as um, many diseases, but the spread of this epidemic and pandemic, now it, it, it gives an indication, it gives a signal that why, what is really happening with us whether this kind of development is sustainable or not. You can see that our data says now we are in minus 23% GDP. So it is not only for India, even across the nations, you can see the economic growth is severely hampered just because of one virus, just because of one disease. So such kind of spread of epidemics and pandemics have challenged the economic growth of the whole world. So that's why, there is, that's why we are suffering what is known as the challenge for sustainable development. The such kind of development is not sustainable. Now we, we have to accept. We have been saying this for the past 20 years. 
but now this virus has taught us yes such kind of development is not sustainable at all root what is the root cause root cause is very clear ecosystem degradation and contamination the un has announced this century as the century for restoring the earth that we have degraded our mother, mother earth enough in the last few centuries now we must dedicate the whole century for restoring the earth if we want to ensure the sustainable development when i am saying sustainable development it includes sustainability in economic growth sustainability in environmental health and sustainability in human health and the conservation of all living resources so the, this, this kind of scenario is very very important to give uh, now we need to adapt some kind of strategies to uh, what is say for sustainable development and un has also announced this in the 2021 to 2030 as a un decade of ecosystem restoration so that means this decade the next decade where you all of you are going to play a very significant role let me be very frank that how we can design our earth there is a challenge our more than 75% of the earth surface is degraded or contaminated now because of pandemic our development is severely hampered so that means we need to evolve certain tools and techniques where we can ensure the sustainability sustainability in living day to day living sustainability in our behavior sustainability in our economic growth sustainability in our environmental conservation and so on so that there is a harmony between nature and the human so that the nature conservation is ensured but at the same time development is also ensured so there is a gentle reminder from the covid 19 that we must adopt strategies for sustainable development we must ensure the conservation of nature resources otherwise our our development is not going to be sustainable at all so major challenge is ecosystem degradation and contamination and what is the yellow brick road see i i'll say you you remember the story of uh, wizard of oz in the, now you know the, the how uh, they, they she identified got dotty identified the yellow brick road so that she could reach the destination so what is the yellow brick road for us now so yellow brick road for us is nothing but ecosystem restoration we must learn to translate the ecological theories and principles to develop new tools and techniques and marketable products so that we can contribute to the industrial sustainability so that we can contribute to the environmental restoration so that we can contribute to the conservation of natural resources and biodiversity if we learn those tricks i am saying don't think about only the learning the basics or only learning the fundamentals of ecology but we must learn we must go ahead in this new decade how we can translate the knowledge into marketable product marketable marketable processes marketable policies and market, marketable behavior so that you can lead the market you can you can what is it enter into the entrepreneurship but at the same time you can also restore the mother earth you can also ensure the sustainable development so this is what i i'm going to discuss and i'll be very happy to, to take your feedback so that i can improve my thinking as well so here today we are going to discuss on how uh, our happiness is challenged because of loss of ecosystem health and how the we have a chance to design the earth too there is no second earth let me tell you if you look at the in past three decades research people try to search for new earth that yes there can be a new earth in a similar kind of planet or like earth but nobody could found so that means we have only one earth when i'm saying earth too that means the same earth can we redesign can we contribute can we learn the principle of ecology and environment and implement to redesign the earth so that it's a new new earth and where i'm referring as earth too so we'll discuss how the ecosystem health and happiness and social well being are linked what are the tools to design the earth too and then how then youth can be empowered to design the sustainable society and industry see if you remember in these ecosystems provide large number of direct benefits and indirect benefits which we say the ecosystem goods and services and these services are more than 145 trillion us dollar per annum so that means these ecosystems are providing large number of benefits to human society and which is more than 150 45 trillion us dollar now we are more concerned about the 3 trillion economy or 5 trillion economy and there is an economy of natural capital which is more than 145 trillion us dollar that we we must protect conserve and ensure that these benefits are available to us let me tell you otherwise we have to pay and they, there are large number of benefits which these ecosystem provides 
I'll give you only two examples. See, these, uh, I'll, I'll give example of pandemic and epidemic itself. There are many uh, pathogens which are present in, in the, what you say in ecosystem, natural ecosystem, but they live very happily because they have their natural host available, whether it can be plants, some wild plants or some animals. So they're living very happily. For example, in case of COVID-19, the coronavirus live very happily with the, this natural host. But when the ecosystems are degraded and contaminated, and now, in fact, there are many studies in last couple of months which has correlated very clearly that the spread of COVID-19 is because of ecosystem degradation and ecosystem contamination. When we interfere with the natural processes in principle where these pathogens live very happily, then they come out. For example, because of ecosystem degradation and because of, you know, and what do you say, the interaction with the wildlife, which is undesirable, then they look for the new alternate host and then they evolve. So that's how the COVID-19 coronavirus has evolved into COVID in a new strain, which is now causing the, what is a pandemic to the human health. So the spread of such kind of disease has been correlated, even not only for COVID-19, let me be very frank. Even take example of SARS, Ebola, or MERS, the people, there, there has been a direct correlation Whenever we have interfered and degraded the ecosystems, that's how the new emergence of new diseases has become very common across the nation. So that means these ecosystems retain these pathogens and maintain it. They don't come out. But when you interfere, degrade those ecosystems, then they come out. And then that's how the epidemic and pandemic comes. So you take example of the cultural diversity. I'll give you another kind of services. The human culture has evolved along with the biodiversity. India is rich in culture because we are rich in biodiversity. If we look at the cultural diversity and ecosystem diversity has been correlated. If you look at the, in, what do you say, the Northeast or the Western India, if you look at the North in India and the South India, our cultures are different, rituals are different because we interact with the different kind of ecosystems, where, whether it's tropical rainforest or desert ecosystem, whether it's alpine forest or tropical rainforest. So we have different kinds of ecosystem. We interact with the different bioresources. That's why our rituals are different. So we are different in, you know, we differ in ritual diversity across the different regions of the India. So that's why, because of ecosystem diversity, because of biodiversity, we are rich in cultural diversity. If we lose those ecosystems, we are going to lose our cultural diversity as well. So that means the society is going to be rich in, in diversity in terms of culture, if our biodiversity and ecosystems are maintained. Take example of another kind of benefit from the ecosystem, climate regulation. See, let me tell you, next two decades are going to be very serious two or two three decades because of climate change whether it's agriculture in sustainability whether it's industrial sustainability right now we are dealing with pandemic wait you will be calling me again because the climate change is going to affect now our agro diversity as well as the industrial security in next couple of years we are going to have let me tell you more more discussion on climate change as well because right now we are we want to come out from the COVID-19, but the climate change is 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 a, one of the major threat in the next two and three decades, where we are going to suffer. So that means then this climate change is because of what? Because of the unregulated release of uh, the carbon dioxide and many land use practices which release more carbon dioxide than the, what you say the sink which we have already destroyed the forest ecosystems and many sinks and natural sinks which are available. We have destroyed those ecosystems. Which, which serve as a sink, but we have added more CO2 in, in the environment. That's why the CO2 concentration is increased and there is a climate change and global warming. So this is, the climate regulation is one of the important benefits which we get from the ecosystem. Let me tell you, even in the UN, in, there are many schemes which you might be aware of that in forest ecosystems, which serve as a sink, which serve as a sink for CO2, the UN gives, the, what do you say, the, uh, some incentive to those countries which are protecting those those kind of forests because forest cutting contributes more than 16 percent of co2 emission globally so if we those ecosystems are protected so there will be no release further at the same time the co2 sequestration of those ecosystems are also very high that the challenge is when we destroy some of these key ecosystems we not only destroy the sinks but we convert those areas as a source of co2 because once the forests are, forest are cut, there are solar radiations released to the forest floor. And because of high temperature, the microbial activity is very high. And because of microbial activity, the organic matter degradation is high, very high. And that releases the CO2. So that means it's a dual edge problem. 
when you cut those forest ecosystem, you lose the sink, and also you convert those sink as the source of CO2. So that's why UN is giving incentive to many countries, including India. If we conserve those ecosystems, we are going to maintain and retain uh, what you say the climate regulatory benefits from those ecosystems. And if you look at the other kind of benefit which we, we get from those ecosystems are uh, what you say they, they serve as source of inspiration for uh, writers, for poets. Okay, so that means the personal excellence is also quite linked with our ecosystem. For example, if I if I'm a poet, if I want to be inspired by nature. Where should I go from if I'm living in Delhi? I should go to Yamuna, which is in, in which is not a river, almost in Nala. Where where should I, I where should I go to see some of the pristine forest? If you look at the Delhi ecosystems, it's mostly either it's invasive species or some degraded abandoned mines are present. So where should I get the inspiration? So that means the ins natural inspiration for painter, writer, poets, they're missing. So if you remember some of the, our critical and unique in the poetries and the novels, they, are, they, are, they have been inspired by the nature, whether it's cloud or forest or rivers and so on. So we don't have, so we are going to lose the inspirational value uh, from those ecosystems as well. But what is the most important among these ecosystem services are regu uh, supporting services. These supporting services are nothing but soil formation, nutrient cycling and primary productivity. When I'm saying the supporting services, to make it very simple, the soil health should be restored. Soil health should be maintained. If soil health is maintained, there is a 145 trillion US dollar flow of those benefits annually. But what is happening? More than 800 billion US dollar soil erosion is happening every year. We are losing the soil. And you remember, if you know it, one centimeter of soil is developed in 200 to 800 years. One centimeter of soil. It takes 200 to 400 years. And to become it's more fertile, it takes 2,000 to 3,000 years. So you can understand when we are losing the soil health, we are losing the nature's work, nature's work of past 2,000 and 3,000 years. So once this soil is lost, it's not easy. Let me tell you, because we can't build soil. You, we can't build soil. Even one centimeter takes 200 to 400 years. Okay. So that means what we have done in the past is. We have destroyed the foundation of ecosystems and we have destroyed the foundation of civilization that soil. So if we want to restore the happiness, if we want to restore the sustainability in our industry, we must restore what is known as soil health. So the soil has become the most critical than in the past. So this is what if you look at the most of these eco, what you say sustainable development goal. Now the UN says 2021 and 2030 is the decade of action. We have worked enough. We have learned enough. Now we must dedicate this decade to demonstrate that how we can take action for sustainability. So this seminar, which you are, uh, you are attending has become very critical. Let me tell you it's 2020. So we must learn something from this seminar and take one agenda, at least, at least one small in the work, I sh we should identify each one of us that this is what I'm going to do in next 20, 10, 10 years where I can contribute to the sustainability. Because if you look at the networking of these in sustainable development goal, the foundation lies again in what? In the, the what do you say, the environmental goals, where the soil health, air health, water health, and biodiversity. These are the foundation of all the sustainable development goals. This networking will, will work only when the soil health is maintained only when the environmental is conserved. Otherwise, this networking will not work. Let me tell you, it will remain as a theory and more hypothesis. So natural ecosystems and happiness and personal excellence are linked, quite linked. Let me tell you, there's a recent study in scientific report where they have worked on more than around 185 countries and they have analyzed around uh, what do you say 13,400 or 500 uh, photographs across the nation. What they have identified is they have studied very critically, let me tell you, and there are many meta-analyses are also available. What they have identified is human beings remain happy when they interact closely with the nature. The loss of happiness is because we have lost our connection with the nature and then we identified our happiness in something else. 
maybe some which is which are important of course no doubt in the some kind of materialistic approach but at the same time that kind of happiness is temporary but when we interact with the nature then we our what do you say sustainable happiness we achieve what is known as sustainable happiness look at i uh, i'll ask you whenever you are little bit mm, your mood is not uh, uh, very high and you are feeling sad what do you, what do we do we go back and uh, look at if you are having the album or you have the uh, mobile you go on seeing your old photographs or or the photographs of, along with your friends or photograph when you visited some area and most of these photographs across the nation what people have found is either they are close to the plant or some wildlife some tree some river some mountain grasslands flower bee butterfly so that means whenever it's very common this report is very unique it says that whenever we interact with the nature whether it's a mountain or we, we want to remember we want to capture our photograph where to be happy whenever we are close to the na na nature let me tell you it can be a plant it can be tree it can be butterfly it can be some flower let me tell you so we or even a rock we always uh, sit on a rock and we take our photograph why because we feel happy so happiness is linked when we interact with the nature so the, there are large number of studies which has come out recently in 2020 and 2019 which across the nation where people have identified the sustainable happiness come when the human being interact with the nature so if you are going to destroy the nature so that means we are going to lose what, what is known as sustainability in our happiness as well because for example if i'm sitting in delhi if i to take my students to show some pristine forest i have to travel at least 235 kilometers away from delhi to show them pristine ecosystem it's not available nearby so uh, you can understand and you ask the students whenever we go to the field trip they always feel happy it's not only because they want to enjoy the what you say the the company of their friends but at the same time when they interact with the nature they remain isolate uh, isolated and they enjoy the be scenic beauty they learn from the nature they feel very happy so na nature gives sustainable happiness to the human being it is very well accepted now what is uh, what we are i mean we are suffering with we have become what is known as from nature smart to nature deficit human beings if you remember more than 200 more than 2.5 million years we have spent along with the nature and ecosystems it is only in 10000 and 12000 years or uh, we have come to the villages and towns and if you look at in the more than 100000 generations we were in the ecosystems it is only 400 to 600 generations we have come to the villages and towns but the problem is now we have we have lost the connection with the nature now we have become more is what is known as nature deficit disorders we have we have been suffering it because we have lost uh, to use all the senses together there is attention difficulty and high rate of physical and emotional illness and if you look at the nature deficit disorder has become very common i challenge you you keep one day digital fast electronic fast don't look at the laptop don't look at the mobile don't look at the tv see how it works if our mobile is not working we leave the food we want to go to the market and make it make it repaired or we want to purchase new because we are, we are the prisoners of uh, these uh, new technologies so, so this is nothing but nature deficit disorder where the decreased creativity decreased cooperation reduced focus increased obesity and reduced drive for exploration has become very common let me if you take critically in all the leading uh, what do you say the companies international companies and multinational companies they organize separate trips regularly they advise that you go and take leave forced leave and interact with the nature go out okay so because they know the creativity and drive for exploration and the innovation comes when we go back to the nature and you know rejuvenate so interacting with the nature is a most important thing now nature deficit disorders have become very common now uh, this model i think i have discussed several times but this is very important and very close to my heart and i i want to discuss once again there there's one of the very unique uh, psychologists from harvard university and then he has given meslos he has given a different kind of model that how the there are different hierarchy of needs the human being has initially he thought that 
if you look at the lower order of needs and higher higher order of needs if initially he thought that if the lower order of needs are met then the people start moving the upwards but there are many exceptions as well where the people try to compromise and they don't bother too much about the lower order of needs and they jumped more on the higher order of needs see why this is important if you look at the, what is the freedom fighter sages historians the nobel laureates in econ in economics or science and uh, look at some of the le world leaders they work on the higher order of needs and higher level of consciousness in this model let me tell you so and but the, there is a global survey where the people have found that most of us throughout the world we don't reach to the higher level of subconsciousness that's why we are not able to achieve excellence in our life although all of us have the potential to achieve excellence in one or other area and each area, each person is unique and each person has some kind of ability to achieve excellence in the, his or her own area but if you look, take the survey then uh, of 25 years or 30 years uh, young people ask them 100 people that what they want to do mostly and almost all all of them will say that they want to achieve excellence in their life they want to contribute to the society and the nation they want to serve the humanity and they want to earn money no doubt and then hence some money so that they can take care of their family and they can support their and uh, what do you say the close friends and relatives but you ask the same set of 100 people when they reach to the 60 65 what happened in your life let me tell you there is a global data available which says 5 to 10 percent will say that they have achieved excellence you can see you don't need to ask 5 to 10 percent will say they are doing very well and most of them are doing good no doubt they are, they are doing well but they could not achieve the excellence what they for what they are they were designed let me tell you so that means our young people when india is the youngest country and we want to ensure that those young people should achieve excellence much early in their life and excellence should not be exception but it should be common so that can happen only when the, the lower order of needs are met much early in their life and whose responsibility is this it's our responsibility so that we can then these lower order of needs are met by the ecosystem health and environmental health whereas the higher order of need is when they actualize their uh, own potential they work on their worthy goals and then then they achieve the excellence in their life if the lower order of needs are not not met then most of our time will go to meet the basic requirement for our sustenance rather than working on worthy goals and this is what which is happening in you know, across the world even in india that we are we are focused more on the lower order of needs rather than working on worthy goals and the life's goals and achieving the higher order of in subconsciousness and achieving the excellence early in life but we can ensure because once these ecosystems uh, are and our environment are healthy then they can achieve excellence much early in their life now the problem is the, the ecosystems uh, are degraded and contaminated and then there are it is affecting the quality of life there are many disorders which were uncommon in past 20 years back they have become common let me tell you and then because of that the, there is a biodiversity crisis and there is a human health crisis across the world if you look at some of these toxicants let me tell you i'll i'll ask you to do one survey today all of you you must in your home categorize your home into three different sections one is electric and electronic gadgets another is your kitchen and bathroom area and you look at some of the other household activities which you use what are the products or for example personal care products categorize the into three categories identify what are those products which are available look what are the chemicals which are being released by those personal health care products or some of the kitchen utensils or some in some of the chemicals which you use in bathroom what are those chemicals which are being released in which category they are you will identify many from even electric and electronic gadgets so there are many chemicals which serve as what is known as endocrine receptors and genotoxicants what do you mean genotoxicants cause genetic disorders and they trigger disease like cancer and there are endocrine receptors which contribute to the what do you say the dysfunctioning and dysregulation in our reproductive health because they mimic like our what do you say the reproductive hormones and when it goes to the body then 
the body is not able to recognize whether it is it's a hormone and then they take the signal and then there is a malformation of there are many kind of disease which occur so such kind of genotoxicants and endocrine receptors we have released in the past enough into our environment whether it's water whether it's soil or air and they are they have become common and because of this there are many factors because of because of uh, due to which the biodiversity crisis happen but one of the important causes of biodiversity crisis is pollution the spread of these toxicants which are known as genotoxicants and endocrine receptors and there are many diseases which are happening whether it is otter alligator fish mollusk or even the birds so because of this the population is declining and this such kind of disorders are not only happening in the, what do you say the alligator or mollusk or birds or earthworms it is also happening in the human male and human female so such kind of disease and they become very common now you can understand india is the youngest country no doubt our youth we have the youngest population in what do you say and if you compare the whole world but at the same time they are challenged with the quality of life they are not able to focus on their worthy goals there are highest level of distraction they they are struggling hard in the lowest order of need rather than working at the highest level of subconsciousness so how they can achieve excellence so it's our duty to ensure to what do you say to create an environment to create a system an ecosystem where the our young what do you say our youth in this country can work much early in their life to achieve the highest goal to work on their worthy goal so that they can achieve excellence much early in their life so that the excellence has become common rather than exception so diminished ecosystem services and poor quality of life is the challenge now how we can achieve it there are many tools let me tell you there are many ways but as a student of ecology and environment i am going to offer you that there is there is a tool of ecosystem restoration which can help you to redesign your earth you can design this is an opportunity let me tell you even if more than 65 or 70 percent earth is degraded and contaminated okay so that's not your problem because you have inherited this earth by at the same time at this moment now we we have some kind of tools which have been evolved in the past which can play a very significant role you can convert this adversity into an advantage and an opportunity to design the earth the way you want this is this the earth will be earth too so you should take a lead we can help you in serving in, the, in the, to guide you to learn those skills so that you can translate the ecological principles for conservation of environment and restoration of ecosystem so what is our goal if you look at very carefully we want a diverse a society which is rich in culture we want our the, the environmental challenges should be minimized whether it's climate change or spread of epidemics or pandemics or, or what is it the ground water recharge should be high and uh, the kind of if you look at the flash flood intensity in the cyclone they have become common yes it's a natural phenomena no doubt and it's a global phenomena no doubt it is a atmospheric phenomena no doubt but the intensity of damage has increased because our ecosystems are degraded and contaminated you look i'll give you just two examples so that you can correlate take example of recent in west bengal where the cyclone came where the damage occurred more where the our mangroves ecosystems were degraded and contaminated go and check reports are available let me tell you I mean, if you look at the tsunami in the past and the cloud burst in uttarakhand or then what do you say the floods in, in uh, what do you say in jammu kashmir or cyclone in regular cyclone in odisha and then the damage occurred or tsunami in nicobar and chennai then the damage occurred wherever the ecosystems were degraded and contaminated because these ecosystems act as insurance to the humanity they act as insurance to the inland community let me tell you so once you know, for example i have adopted i have taken some insurance policy but this insurance bond, bond which the paper which is not available to me and it has gone to the waste paper basket whether i can take advantage no and similarly these ecosystems act as insurance to to us when they are degraded you cannot take the benefit of those insurance let me tell you so we must invest early in our life now to restore our ecosystem so that you, you can renew your insurance policy now 
if you look at the population and biodiversity, there is the foundation of all ecosystem services. There are a large number of benefits, direct and indirect, which we get from ecosystems. But the net output is social well-being and human well-being. And what is that human well-being? Security. Security against the natural calamities. Basic material for good life. For example, whether when the food is available, if food is available, it is accessible. If it is accessible, whether it is toxic and free and nutrition rich, if we have the basic material for good life, that means we have a high, high quality of life. If, if you are ill, whether health, health, health benefits you, you can get, you, you can see the pandemic has come, then, then, then we don't have what you say, the, the hospital facilities. It's not only in this country, across the nation, in, in, in different parts of the world, the whole health system collapsed. So that means if health system is not available to all, the quality of life is not then very high. Let me tell you. And if we are going to compete with each other for what you say the, during the, uh, the natural calamity or for access of good material of life and for access to health services, how we can have the good social relationship. So that means this, if we look at the single indicator of high quality of life is one on the right hand side, freedom of choice and action. What do you mean by freedom of choice and action? All of us have some worthy goals in our life. We want to do something in, the, in our life before we leave this planet. Whether we are working on those worthy goals or not. If you have this freedom of choice and action, that means you have the high quality of life. If you are focusing on the, 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 the first column, the, to get the security, to get the basic material of good life, to get the basic health securities, that means we don't have a good quality of life. We are working on high, lower order of needs. The higher order of need lies in freedom of choice and action. That's why in most developed countries, most of the people, they don't work on lower order of needs. They are available because of ecosystem health, but they work on most of the time on freedom of choice and action. So they work on more worthy goals. That's why they achieve excellence. So if we want to ensure that our youth work on freedom of choice and action, they work on worthy goals, they achieve excellence in their life. We must ensure the basic, the lower order of need should be met. And that is why I'm saying the ecosystem health becomes very important, environmental health becomes very important. And how it can be, how it can be done, let me tell you. See, ecosystem restoration, we must understand the degraded ecosystems are cannot be restored by simple plantation. Because to make the area green is not a restoration. Because how you can identify the ecosystem is degraded or contaminated, you will identify there is a change in, in alteration of the species, whether it's plants or animal or insects or bird. They, their population will start changing and some of them will go away, local extinction will happen and some of the, these species will become more dominant and overall species diversity get reduced. But this is an indicator when you see these are the visible changes, but there is another invisible change happening in these area in the soil, beneath the soil, where the microbial communities are altered. And because such areas lose the microbial communities, that's why there is a degradation and contamination because ecosystem lose its resilience because the microbial communities are lost. Because these microbial communities drive the, what is the supporting services, soil formation, nutrient cycling, and they do help in plant growth and so on. So that means in ecosystem restoration, when these microbial communities are lost, then ecosystem resilience is poor or lost or breaks down, and then ecosystems become degraded and contaminated. So in restro ecosystem restoration or restoration ecology, what we focus is, we focus on reviving and restoring the resilience of ecosystems by restoring those lost plant microbial communities, which act as a, what you say, what is a pioneer species to restore and trigger those ecosystem processes which help in ecosystem development. So in, in case of um, restoration ecology, we focus on what is known as plant microbe associations. We identify those plants which act as nurse species, which can restore the soil quality much early and much fast. And where, from where those plants come? From the natural ecosystem. What are those plants? Mostly the wild grasses and legumes. They play a very significant role. They, they act on those hard rocks where the nutrients are poor, moisture is less, organic matter is low, and nutrients are low, heavy toxic metals. These wild grasses and legumes, they enrich the soil health. And these microbes restore those in the soil biological processes which help in restoring the soil health so that they invite the other species to come back and then that that's how the restoration natural restoration also occur 
so what in the restoration ecology or ecosystem restoration our focus is to restoration of those ecological processes which are responsible for ecosystem sustenance and maintenance so once those processes are restored what are those processes? natural resources natural processes once those processes are restored the ecosystem restoration can be triggered and once those ecosystem restoration means those plants and animals and so microbial communities which used to exist in those areas that should be restored back why because first of all afforestation and deforestation is not the solution to restore those more than 65% and 70% of the degraded earth surface because 145 trillion us dollar lies in natural ecosystems not in green areas you can plant something and something may grow by chance that will not give you 145 trillion us dollar the natural ecosystems those plants birds insects and microbes which used to exist in those area area those ecosystems that should be restored that's how the natural eco the restoration of ecosystem is different than afforestation and deforestation program so we focus on ecosystem restoration and these plants and the micro when it has been uh, introduced into the field and it has we have we have done in the in delhi ecosystems and there is a center called center for uh, environmental management of degraded ecosystem in delhi university where they have done in in delhi in different parts of the india and they have restored in large number of ecosystems in this country let me tell you. so given a chance you must visit the center and you must interact with the scientists and the, and the director of the center professor babu so that you can learn about the restoration and how it can be restored because it's not a myth it's a reality it has been done in the field so the but the fundamental principle is same must restore the soil biological processes must restore the plant soil and microbial relationship must restore those plant and animal species which were what do you say which were present in those areas that e ecosystem and community should be restored that's the ecosystem restoration so similarly we also worked on another uh, degraded lands or contaminated lands where fly ash dumps and you know in delhi there are more than uh, 3 330 hectare lands of fly ash dumps because we have the coal fired thermal power station and these uh, fly ash dumps are again rich in toxic metals large number of toxic metals even radionuclides and poor in organic matter poor in moisture and no moisture retention no organic matter and so the, the nutrients are poor and nitrogen is almost deficient nothing is present so we have used the same principle of plant micro associations and restore those areas and that means ecosystem restoration is possible and it is not it's not a theory it's a reality we once we identify those biological inputs we can uh, what they develop a consortium of those plant microbes to introduce into the field to ensure the ecosystem restoration and that is marketable let me tell you there are many companies in gujarat and many in other parts of the, the country they have come up and mostly they are dominated by the engineers then they know how the, the technology can be introduced in the field and so on but they don't know the biology they don't know the ecology they don't know the plant and micro association so they're looking for such people who are trained in those ideas that how to and develop those technologies because they have they know the they are they are mbas and engineers they can do marketing they can what do you say and develop the marketable products but the the idea lies in the nature because we have learned from the nature and we have introduced the same nature nature's principle we have not done anything we have learned from the nature so because in the nature's laboratory and for millions of years the nature has done the experiment and selected those plants microbe and in the animal communities and bird communities where we don't need to do anything we can't evolve those uh, what is a plant microbe and insect but we could identify we can identify based on the natural principle and that's why we are trained in so you must learn those ecology in ecological principles ecological ideas how to identify those plants and micro because once you know this skill you will be let, let me tell you you will be hired you will you can make multi billion dollar let me tell you because in globally there is a multi billion dollar industry for restoration of ecosystems for for industrial sustainability for treatment of waste water so that if you know those ideas you can make money let me tell you so what you can do is you can make two two things you can earn money and you can also ensure the nature what is a conservation and you can also ensure the conservation of ecosystems so these are the ideas where we need what is a training more training and more focused training in the next coming decade so that 
the ecosystem restoration is not, not becoming a more like a pandemic. It should be across the country, across the world, so that we can execute the ideas of ecosystem restoration. So the, the idea is, yes, now we know the plant microbe associations help. We know, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in case of abundant mines where we worked, we know that um, the iron was rich, but it was not available to the plants and microbes because it was present in bound form. So what we did is we identified those microbes which release certain compounds which can solubilize those complexes, insoluble complexes, and make the iron available for the plants and microbes. So that means we must identify the kind of stresses which are present in those degraded ecosystems. And based on those stresses, you must identify the right tool, biological tool. And you must identify those plants and microbes which can engineer those habitat and make it more productive. So you can transform the degraded lands into ecologically productive land. You can convert the wasteland and degraded lands into socially relevant sites by knowing which plants and which microbes you should identify. So depending upon the kind of stresses and challenges present in the site, you can identify the right biological input. So this is what we have done. But again, there are challenges because many a times the, when you introduce those microbes, they don't survive. If they don't survive, they don't colonize. Even if they colonize, they don't multiply. So they, there are many challenges in the environment, let me tell you, because they, it's a harsh environment, those degraded and contaminated sites. So we have gone back again to the, the nature's principle. I'll, I'll tell you now in the next few minutes, what is those natural principles? Before that, you must know that when you are following people, so it's a more like a what is it? Uh, you are just following the path. Uh, what is it? Some um, the mob, and ultimately we are not going to reach anywhere. You will be part of the crowd, just one. But if you look at carefully, that there there is a possibility. There are a herd of sheep. They are doing something. But you can be one who is thinking differently. You may be alone in the beginning, no doubt, because you are different. Your idea is different. But you must know that your idea is based on, for example, if you are working on ecosystem restoration, if your idea is strong and based on strong foundation of ecological science, strong foundation of theoretical science, and if you are working on some uh, area of economics or political science or social science, that your idea is based on some, some kind of theories and principles on those disciplines. If you are very confident, be alone. I'll advise you, be alone. But you must know that your idea is supported by some strong, uh, what do you say, theoretical foundation. So you may be alone, but soon the herd will follow you and you will be the leader. Right now you are alone. But once you do it, show some results, then the whole herd will follow you and you will be leading the whole mob. So that means idea can play a very significant role. So must learn to raise new questions. So if you know the great leaders and the great thinkers, they ask great questions. So look for the right question. Look for the right question and then try to make your own path so you can lead the world. Whether it's market, whether it's industry, whether it's politics, whether it's science or any other walk of the life, you must develop your idea which is unique to you okay? and then work over it. So the idea where in the restoration ecology I'm going to share is unique. To the, but it is based on again the natural principle. So how this challenges of restoration which I shared with you, yes it has given the results. You have seen the, well, you can see and visit many sites which has been restored in India and that is based on this principle only. But then again we have to move to the next level or we have to develop the next generation of restoration practices based on what? Based on again ecology and sociobiology of living organisms. I will give you one example. Right now if you know how they, these microorganisms interact with each other or with the plants or other living organisms, you can identify just one idea where you can convert that idea, that biological process into a marketable tool. Let me tell you, again, this is the new skill which we have to learn. That learn the theory but translate and transform into marketable product. I will give you an example. Environmental predictors. They are going to be one of the most important tools for monitoring the ecosystem health. Okay, like in case of GDP, now you know that oh, what is the percentage in GDP we have. 
now you have predictions based on certain parameters that how the economy is going to behave in next quarter or next six months or next one year similarly in environment when you are working on environmental technologies you must know some of those predictors so that you can predict the environmental health you can identify some kind of model so that you can predict that how this trajectory of environment health will move in next three months six months or one year or even decade and that is a marketable product let me tell you once you identify those area convert these ecological theories into new models of ecosystem restoration identify the new biomonitoring tools let me tell you so that you can monitor what you can monitor the ecosystem health when i'm saying ecosystem health i'm talking about the pathogens let me tell you do you have any in, uh, right now do you have any model to predict or monitor the what is a covid 19 what we are doing is we are as we are taking the blood sample or sputum sample or the secretion from the body and seeing whether it is present or not but right now we don't have any model that how it is moving across the population and so on across the infection is happening so we don't have what is it some kind of models available so that you can predict only thing is you can predict its epidemiology but you can't predict so similarly in for example take example of agriculture field billions of dollars loss happens because of pathogen spread so if we have a some kind of monitoring tool so that we can predict early that this pathogen is going to come so that we are much ready in advance we can protect our crops similarly in in case of degraded ecosystems once you inoculate those microbes for ecosystem restoration we must know some of the tools so that you can predict pathogens are present or pathogen is going to come or contaminant is present even present it's what level it is present right now what we do we bring the samples in the lab and then we estimate and identify that takes time but do we have some kind of tools which work in real time and at the same time in the complexity of environment because when we bring to this in sample to the soil then we fractionate and purify and so on only then we conduct but do we have any tool which works right in the field right in the complex environment work in the real time and also ultra sensitive so once you develop such kind of tools you can be multi billionaire so must learn those tools and techniques so that you can develop new ideas you can contribute to the field of ecosystem restoration you can contribute to the idea of sustainability and you can make money across the nation let me tell you it will be a global contribution from your side so for i'll give you one example so that you can understand we worked in flyage dumps and in this area there are we were interested in some microbes which produce phytohormones the microbe release some hormones for plants so that plant root growth happens normally because in stress environment degraded site the plant growth is very poor but plant, the microbe release certain phytohormones and assist the plant in their growth but what we have identified is site is same there are two grass species in one case if you add the nitrogen then the phytohormone producers increase in another grass you add phosphate only then in the what do you say the phytohormone producer in peace so that means site is same plants are different but amendments soil amendment is different so once you know these ideas that how you should based on the different species the amendment should happen so that the desirable result is same this is a marketable product let me tell you it is you can make money so these ideas are important to identify the predictors in the environment and i'll give you another example see right now what we are talking about is virus yes we are scared of virus covid 19 is one ebola is another one and sars is another one mer is another one and you can name many viruses no doubt but at the same time there are two things which you should remember that the virus has shape our human genome as well so what we are today is because of viruses so basically although there is a loss of life there is a loss of in what is a economic wealth no doubt but virus is shaping us shaping the society shaping the industry and let me tell you shaping our genome as well and this is very, this is true so the some of the viruses they are pathogens we want to control them we want to contain them we want to keep them away no doubt but there are certain viruses which are present in the environment they are very useful as well let me tell you and some of these viruses are very useful as well so for example in nature when we are working on plants and microbe association i am talking about the plant growth promoting bacteria they are present in the root zone of those plants 
so those plant growth promoting rhizobacteria are very important no doubt they help in promoting the plant by solubilizing the nutrients man, from the insoluble mineral complexes by not only solubilizing but even the mobilizing to the plant they mobilize and transport they protect the plant from uh, disease pathogens they what do you say they release uh, the organic matter and nutrients into the soil and they do many many functions let me tell you many useful functions but at the same time when there is a stress environment degraded environment they are also under stress their number goes down the useful bacteria number goes down no doubt which is very na natural and normal but the bacterial viruses which generally kill the bacteria they help under stress environment to their host because these bacterial viruses they infect the bacteria and cause the lysis kill the cell no doubt but at the same time we must remember these bacterial viruses they survive inside the bacterial cell if all the bacterial cells die they will also die so the, in evolution the nature what nature has done is these bacteriophages under stress environment they help the bacteria to survive by transferring genes so that they can adapt to the stress environment they survive multiply in large number and they help the plants for plant growth so this is what i want to emphasize that we have not used these bacterial viruses in the field let me tell you but it is happening in the nature i am not asking to engineer some virus to an introduce into the nature no it is happening in the nature if you look at the global level more than 2/3 of carbon and nitrogen cycle global level is because of bacterial viruses so these bacterial viruses help at the global level in biogeochemical cycle these bacterial viruses they introduce the genes to increase the fitness of the host bacteria they introduce genes to create diversity in those populations so that means they help at the population le level as well in community microbial community when some species start dominating these bacterial viruses kill the dominant bacteria and bring it down so that they create a niche to so that the other bacterial species can grow so that means they help in richness of microbial species so bacterial viruses such a unique organism which is present in the nature untapped little known little exposed little understood they help the at the individual level they help the population level they help the community level they help the ecosystem level and at the global level by by geochemical cycle so such kind of uh, organism which is present in the nature we must learn those ideas from the nature and introduce along with those bacteria and plant growth promoting bacteria and plant we must also introduce what is say the bacterial viruses so this is my idea for next generation of uh, what is a restoration ecology so we must then identify from the nature and introduce into the nature so no foreign organisms we are going to introduce and the look at the diversity let me tell you diversity of uh, bacterial viruses is still not much understood let me tell you if you look at the 60s in, in the late 60s the classification of viruses came and even up to 2018 more or less we were following in the same way except we you started using the molecular tool but there was not much differentiation in the taxonomy when we worked on one of the big, uh, vibrio viruses and we could identify the new order not only the new species or genera in phage but the new order we contributed and that paper was published in nature so what i'm saying is even for academic interest these bacterial viruses are an untapped diversity which are not not known much known that may be because of many reasons maybe they are difficult to isolate may are they are difficult to work with maybe say in in the past the technologies were not suitable available to work more specifically but now we are lucky that we have many techniques available now we have started learning about these viruses much more so this is another opportunity even for academic interest we can work as well as for restoration part so the idea is we want to save the restoration ecology has done good in the past it's not a theory it's a reality it has been done in different parts of the country as well as in the world which is reality where we introduce on the left hand side you can see the where we introduce the plant microbes and combination of those useful consortium and where the restoration occurs and they grow well but we want to say that next generation restoration practices would be on the right hand side when you will start introducing the bacterial viruses along with the bacteria and from where those bacterial viruses will come from the nature from how this idea will develop learn from the nature so that you will move to the next generation of restoration practices and whatever you achieve in several years it can be reduced to few years and months
So the, the plant growth would be much accelerated and heavy. So this would be the new or next generation of restoration practices and the new idea. Maybe initially you are just like a sheep, you are alone, but soon people will follow. If you work on nature-based solution, okay? So we are learning from the nature, implementing the nature. So these filamentous phages are also very unique, let me tell you. They're easy to manipulate chemically, genetically, genome can be modified, you can express antibodies, proteins, or some kind of genes and receptor molecule. That's the uniqueness. And how, just because of this, and the ease of this manipulation, what you could achieve is, you can develop into what is, what is known as ultra-sensitive bio biomarker. You can, what biosensor you can develop. What do you mean? Right now, I told you that we bring the soil or water sample or plant sample and we, what we do is, we estimate those uh, nutrients, toxicants and bacteria which are present in the environment. But using these biosensors, first of all, these kilometer phages can be integrated on different platform of biosensor which are already worked out. Whether it's micromechanical, electrochemical or optical, they can be integrated in all the surfaces. And based on the expression of unique molecule on the surface, you can identify 100 cells per ml, 10 cells per ml, or even one cell per ml from the nature, in the natural environment, okay? And you can identify one virus also in per ml of the solution, not in the lab, in the field itself. So it has a too much potential. You can convert those ideas into marketable product, let me tell you. And these filamentous phages can be used both for biomonitoring as well as controlling the pathogens and increasing the plant growth. So our model is, if you use the phages, along with the bacteria and plants. So you will have a benefit at the individual level, population level, community level, and you will trigger the ecosystem restoration much fast because this idea has been developed in the nature's laboratory, not in my laboratory. I have used my laboratory to learn what is happening in the nature. Nature has been doing this experiment for millions of years and selected the best processes. So I've, I'm just learning and listening, identifying those nature, nature processes by working in the lab and in the field and just going back to the nature using the same natural processes. So if you use this principle, that means you are going to work on next generation of restoration practices. So this is what I want to say. Use this idea for convert, to, to translate the ecological theories into the marketable product. What, what, is, what we are going to gain, what society is going to gain? We are going to have workforce of ecological entrepreneurs. And these ecological entrepreneurs can be from the field of economics, political science, social science, environmental science, or even law. They can be from different disciplines. What they're going to work and de deliver, let me tell you. They, their aim is environmental stewardship, so that they can develop the sustainable market in society. Okay? So what they're going to deliver? They're going to deliver actionable strategies. If you're working, if you're MBAs and you are also done the ecological entrepreneurship program with us or some other group, so you can develop good policies and strategies for the industries so that they, it becomes sustainable. You can develop the policies and, and what do you say, and give help to the government. You can develop technologies or you can, if you're from language, whether it's in Indian language or English language or any other language, so you can engage in making more meaningful public debate so that you can increase the acceptability to the policies and technologies by the society. And it can be useful in business management. So that means people from different disciplines can work on ecological entrepreneurship. What is their influence? They can influence the individual, household, community, organization, industry, and the government. And the aim is to develop and restore the harmony between the ecology, economy, and society. For what? To restore the happiness at the individual level. For what? To achieve the excellence at the individual level. For what? To maintain the cultural diversity at the society level. For what? To achieve the sustainability at the national level. To what? To make cooperation at the intercontinental and the global level. So these ecological entrepreneurs can play a significant role, not only in the next decade, but even the coming decades. So we must adopt these ideas as early as possible so that our youth can participate to design the new earth, the earth too, to provoke to design their career in a much more meaningful and uh, what is the concept where they can play a significant role both for the society, nation, and the humanity at large. And this can be useful even for consultant. So that, for example, people are doing environmental impact analysis. We don't have trained people. 
So you, you can give consultation to the environmental impact programs. You can also serve as advisor to the industries for uh, what is a traditional knowledge, how the ethnic communities are using some of these medicinal plants and from the ecosystems, you can, you can share the ideas so that pharmaceutical industries can develop a glo global pharmaceutical product. Or you can be an advisor and consultant to the multinational companies. You can develop new ecological restoration practices by learning from the nature. And you can also carry out ecotourism, let us say, to promote the cultural biodiversity and so on. And you can also create green spaces for to practice the spiritualism, and which is a, another new kind of tourism where I think India can play a significant role because we do have what is a rich in different practices in different parts of the country where the spiritual tourism can be important. But at the same time, we need those natural spaces so that it can be a new market, what is a, a, a new income generation area. Okay. In the society, what the society is going to get? It will be a equally trade society. Once you act as an ecological entrepreneur, you will prevent the cultural erosion and biodiversity loss both together. You can help in restoring the broken linkages. See, the, what we have is right now, if you look at, the, look at the current scenario, the uncertain future and broken day, broken today. So we are so scared and the uncertain future. But you can restore the linkages and bonding between the human being, the ecosystems and nature, so that we can achieve the personal excellence. And you can also help in conserving and restoring some of the cultural practices. Elevate the poverty, let me tell you. There are clear models in China and many parts of the world where people have shown that once the ecosystems are re restored, it also helps in poverty elevation and building green economy. Another idea is conservation basic income, so that those communities which are living closely to the, in the ecosystems, which are providing large number of benefits to the human society, they should get some kind of basic income so that they can participate in conservation of ecosystem rather than degrading those ecosystems and changing the landscape for their own benefit because ultimately they have to live. So once you ensure some basic income to those people, those communities, which are more close to the, to the threatened ecosystem, then they can help rather than converting those ecosystems or degrading those ecosystems or changing the landscape, they will act on conservation. And this model has been worked even in India and different parts of the world. So though we don't have right now the conservation basic income idea, but some kind of incentive has really helped, but we must ensure some basic income to those communities which are living close to the natural ecosystems, let me tell you, which are directly dependent on those natural ecosystems. Once you ensure, they will be the major actor and player of conservation, let me tell you, rather than you will take them as a threat to the ecosystems and biodiversity. So ecological entrepreneurship rely on nature-based solution. For what? To accelerate ecosystem restoration, restore the happiness in human being, in restoring the excellence or achieving the excellence much early in, early in their life and design the earth too. So learn those ideas. Now this is the time to action. Okay. So once you do it, then that means you are going to play a significant role for the future generation. What we can do is we must translate the ecological skills to convert into industrial product processes and policies. Apply the nature conservation to restore the happiness. Let me tell you. See, whenever we go out, it's very common whenever we go out for three days and four days, not these days, of course, in the, not in the time of pandemic, but otherwise uh, you feel very happy and rejuvenated and you start thinking that, yes, we must work on worthy goals and we can achieve many things because nature restore your, what, what is it, the potential, which, which is otherwise lost. So apply nature conservation to restore the happiness, invest in ecosystem restoration to design the earth. Too. So that's how we can lead to our yellow brick road and that's available. We know where this road will take us. Our destination is very clear to us, but learn the skills, get the equipment ready, get the skills ready, get the knowledge ready so that you can walk through those the yellow brick road because you know many people will come in the in between Iron Man and so many distractions. But if you know if you are in, empowered with the skills, if you know your destination, if you are passionate with your goal, you will reach and cross this yellow brick road. And ecological entrepreneurship is the yellow brick road for the new earth or earth too. So I must thank 
the different scholars who have worked with me and the authors who have contributed to these ideas and publication and web resources, which helped me to develop this concept and my own scholars who contributed and published papers on these ideas. So I, so here we end. And if you have any questions, queries, and I'll be very happy to discuss. Thank you so much, sir, for such a captivating lecture. And it was really an inspir inspiring one. You have uh, made us learn new ways how to retain our happiness. And yes, you have just given us there is hope, hope that yes, still we can restore our earth. Thank you so much, sir. The, now the house is open for questions. So if you have guys have any questions, please do type. Uh, you can type your uh, questions in the chat box or first one, someone can just unmute their mics and ask the first question. So while sir would be answering the questions, other, others may uh, type their questions in the chat box. Please. Okay, uh, Naveen has writ written a question here. Thank you so very much, sir, for showing us a way to re restore our degraded ecosystems and to conserve our natural capital. Sir, natural systems are constantly changing, and sometimes new communities are developing as a res response to prevalent stress. Kindly throw some light on how much damage we can do if we initiate the restoration process with an imperfect understanding of the past succession and with lack of strong science behind the action. Yeah, I'd say one of the important questions, which I think in, in, uh, across the country and all the restoration practitioners face. Okay, uh, I think it's the, the most important question which I think Dr. Naveen has asked. See, the idea is, one, first is to identify the reference ecosystem. If we know the reference ecosystem, only then we can develop a good idea about the restoration model, and how it will be restored, what will be restored, and how it will be uh, introduced in a phase manner, so that you have to compare what is known as the calendar of introduction of different species, so that we know the, which trajectory it will go. Yes, he's right, the, the ecosystems evolve, the community evolves, they go on changing. So that means we must have some kind of reference ecosystem available, whether it's a small patch, if it is li live. And so we need to carry out the extensive survey of those communities, those areas in the same agroclimatic zones so that we can identify the reference ecosystems. We can also use the previously published data and uh, scientific data so that we can identify some of those, the communities and assemblage of communities which we want to restore. We can also rely on the flora and fauna so that we can identify some of those uh, ideas and the, how, which kind of community which we are visualizing it. We can also use the, some of the, uh, what do you say, some of the, uh, some historical documents and the, um, what do you say, the, and the topo sheets, which are available in, uh, what do you say, the Geological Survey of India or some other areas, so that we can. We can also rely on the aerial photographs, which are available, because earlier we never used to have the remote sensing, it started only 40, 50 years ago in our country. So if we don't have those ideas, so we have to rely on the historical maps. Or if we have to rely on even what is known as, if you go to the in villages that we have the Patwaris who maintains the land and which kind of land it was and so on. So that means though we have to go back and document and refer to the historical account of those areas where we want to restore the practices. And then we can, which is not very authentic, but uh, we since we need to accumulate this data from different sources so we can also you can also interview some of the old people and, and you can ask them what kind of organisms used to exist in plant community used to exist and they can narrate some stories when they were in in doing childhood they used to see, see such kind of birds and animals which is not authentic of course but you can use different sources and then identify the what kind of community which you are going to so that's how we do it so that's how even in the, to identify the which community because it is always evolving and of course in the, that takes a long time because the community and ecosystem evolves over a period of time so we we need to identify some kind of balancing view that which assemblage you are going to introduce and so on so we have to rely on different sources and based on those ideas 
existing some small patch to the published papers and published flora fauna and published in books literature old stories and uh, even some lo local writer who had written some stories and so on so yeah, you have to simulate those uh, what is it assemblages and then you have to work over it but it's a good question let me tell you difficult challenging but uh, that's how one should do it uh, thank you sir for answering that question i just have a follow up question on that so if we are uh, if we are taking a reference ecosystem to to seek that this is what we want to achieve uh, no this is where we want to restore our our degraded ecosystem yeah. to so at one point of time should we go back to identify that reference ecosystem like do we have uh, say i mean we, we cannot just go to the jurassic era sometimes we reset our system so we are yeah. resetting it to you know past one month or two months so where should we go what is the reference in time that you just see see in the ecosystem generally i mean you have to uh, of course you are right we can go millions of years but at the same time in last 200 300 years not a few years but whatever you could see in last 100 years and 200 years that's the right way of doing it but we don't have 200 years old data so you have to go most of the time we get only 50 years or 100 years data so you have to go not a few months but uh, i'll suggest some of the decades back so uh, most of the time mostly not all uh, what is a 100% but most of the time the restoration practitioners are quite lucky even if it's a small patch is available where you can see and relate the published data of last 3 decades and 4 decades and you could correlate yes such kind of community is existing and you know the native ecosystems and native plants communities are present and intact and usually we do find but uh, of course because that is also vulnerable and uh, i mean prone to degradation but you could identify because that that area also serve as a good source of microbes as well not only plants to identify the assemblage of plants but even to isolate some of the microbes Uh, because ultimately you need the plant the microbes which are associated with those plants only so that also help as a source of microbes so I, i'll say a couple of decades thank you sir for answering it yeah. but good question yeah it's a it's a very i i, I think in the, somebody who understands and who very critically the restoration practices can ask such question it's good so that clarifies almost all my doubts that you yeah. know So now we have one more question. So if you want, you can read out the questions from the chat box, or if okay. you want, I can okay. read those as well. No, I can, I can read. Um, I should know where the chat box is. Yes, sir. So where is the chat box? Sir, right hand side. I, I will read it out for you. It would be. No, no, I'll, I'll learn also. No, so you. Okay, you sir, right hand side. Um, may they keep a chat like that top. chat people then chat we have present now then we have so present uh, niche hai upar top mein dekhiyega right hand side agar aapne usko so upar right mein dekhiye pehle people honge and then ek chat box sa bana hua hoga then time yeah yeah yeah, yeah there are six Oh, yeah, no, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, good, good. Now, Shweta is asking. No, she is only thanking me. Yeah. Minali. So, thank you. Yeah, yes, yeah, thank you, Shweta. Minali, sir. Uh, as there are many microbes, which are the indicators of soil health. Yes, you're right. So, how can we identify that a particular soil is in nutrition? See, uh, yes, I think it's it's another important question. See, because most of the time these technologies are site specific. When I'm saying site specific, means for example, uh, in certain area. we need to identify the stresses which are available when i am saying stresses so we must identify the range of nutrients micronutrients and macro nutrients we must estimate so mainly we need to estimate first so that it's a good question so it looks that you planned and something will happen no so we must in, in, uh, what do you say estimate the nutrients both micro and macro nutrients from the soil estimate the organic matter and there are many indicators of soil uh, soil health and among the micro once you identify these are the nutrient which are deficient and these are the toxic elements which are rich because that is also possible that it's not only nutrition de deficient but it can be contaminant rich so once you identify the deficiency and the toxicity then you look for those microbes which can take care of both they can in improve the soil nutrients 
and they can also uh, reduce or remediate the toxicants and these microbes should also work along with those introduced plants so that means you need to identify the relationship between the plant microbe soil so if that kind of harmony you could identify and that we do it so we identify and we do many experiments in the lab first and then we try to identify that which one will work to increase the nutrients and remediate the toxicants and at the same time have has some features which are which we are looking for to increase the plant health then we conduct those experiment with plants and those microbes and in the presence of those um, uh, toxicant and nutrient poor soil and conduct in the laboratory and in the controlled environment then we introduce into the field so that's how there are series of experiments which you need to do but it's very important yeah i think it's a very good question that this is the first step after reference ecosystem we must assess the soil health and we must estimate the toxicant concentration so that we can identify the right microbes because that also help in identifying the microbes good good manali now priya is asking what are the very reactions developed among the children so that they value the see as far as the children are concerned it's very important you are right see ultimately then the success lie with the kids and to be very frank if you ask the children around in your home or in your society they are very very much aware of in the environmental pro actions because the education environmental education has gone to the school level as well so those people are helping them to learn the role of environment and so on and they do have certain practices so once you te tease the kids Uh, what is saying some of these environmental pro activities they can learn and they can take care of the environmental health no doubt and uh, i think the school is taking care of but at the same time i'll suggest in, in what you can do uh, so first learn and interact with the, some of the teachers who are in the college and identify certain birds learn some plants and uh, learn their uniqueness and uh, on sunday every sunday or once in 15 days take your the children around and then tell them the uniqueness about those birds and plants they'll be very attracted uh, show them some plant and and, uh, and explain that in the some um, for example uh, you have catharanthus roseus which is very common in, uh, in many households but it is rich it, it is the source of anti cancer molecules and uh, and uh, the the anti cancer molecules which are being used in the industry not uh, just because they have some kind of property no they they are being used so once you tell them they'll be very excited so you have to develop interest by sharing some stories uh, about those plants and birds and insects so i think they'll be attracted and they'll be very happy to work pro environment and so on so that can be managed so experiential learning i think that will be very important for kids even for us what are the actions uh, we can start from very early life at school to save individual ecosystem see the, the idea is uh, it's very interesting question see i'll suggest the school all the schools do have pressure of their uh, what do you say uh, uh, making their ranking so that they, they they are in the top 5 top top 3 and so on but recently i was in some of the some program where i suggested and the government has accepted that we must institute some kind of uh, what do you say award to the school where the school has shown some kind of uh, example on uh, for sustainable society for green uh, school green activities or whether they have trained the students and they are doing some environmental pro activities in uh, sustain water harvesting or energy saving or some something they have done so or even they have adopted some society they have they have gone to the society once in a month or two two months for environmental awareness so this kind of award is being instituted i think in next year onwards it will be so the school will be motivated because otherwise the schools are also under stress because of their so similarly in in colleges or even in your society you can adopt the local ecosystem adopt if there is a pond we are losing the ponds if there is a pond adopt it maintain it make some awareness program okay so take help of the government they will give money so adopting the local ecosystems adopt Ad not adapt adopt adopt the ecosystems local ecosystem whether it's small or big and then just conserve so society can conserve you can take help of the forest department you can take help of the environment department the delhi it will be 
I think adopting ecosystem will help. Now Priya is saying thank you. Sudha says thanks a lot. It's fine. Uh, idea on it. In this way. Yeah, she is making some comment. You're right. I agree with Sudha and uh, Priya. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I just want to ask you a question. So, uh, like, it will help the budding scientists here uh, who want to do research in the field of bioremediation or biodegradation. So, uh, whenever, so there is a lot of debate these days going on whether uh, when when we are working on some biodegradation or bioremediation so what do you suggest which processes should we uh, emphasize more on uh, like if we have to do the restoration of an area whether soil or water body so a lot of people are criticizing that we should avoid augmenting some new populations of bacteria or any other microorganism into the new environment so how do you take it, sir? What do you suggest? Whether we should stimulate or we should try to use the native flora or microorganisms present there for the restoration, or uh, we can use the bio augmentation there as well. Which would be a better? See, it depends on. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important question and uh, very challenging too, because uh, most of the time people do criticize. You're right. See, it depends on the kind of contaminant which we are, we are dealing with. Say, say, for example, in many cases, only stimulation will work, no other practice will work. If there are yeah. hydrocarbons and there are some organic contaminants, so stimulation will work, let me tell you. Okay. Yes. Okay. The, and that's more economically feasible as well as, and more mm. and more ecologically reliable also. But in depending upon the contaminant, we may need to augment also, because it is likely that in, in, they, they will not will not able to stimulate them to a level where they can play a significant role. Because you know the... Yes minimum viable population size is required to create some kind of action. So unless that, that reaches to the, that population density, they will not be able to do it. So many times in certain intoxicants, stimulation doesn't work, especially in inorganic and toxicants. Then you need to augment. So then you need to, since, since you are isolating from the same area and you are just increasing the numbers, so there should not be much criticism except using some other micro. So, so depending upon the challenge, and the kind of contaminant you need to choose and you you can convince them that they are from the same area so we are not yes, introducing yes. any foreign micro it is not engineered so it's a nature has produced we have just multiplied so i think by convincing and changing the idea it, it will be possible but of course i do agree it's a challenge yes sir Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, if anyone, I don't, I think you have uh, very nicely cleared everyone's doubt here. And thank you so much uh, again. Uh, I I would again like to thank you and extend my sincere gratitude to you for accepting our invite and for such an. It was really an inspiring and a learning experience for all of us, I'm sure. And thanks for telling telling the yellow brick road for us. Uh, and. Uh, the new definition that you have given for the eco restoring happiness and designing the earth 2.0 thank you thank you so much sir and uh, thanks for sharing the very innovative research that you know that your students are doing and it really has helped a, i think a lot of uh, students all of us present here it has really helped us to know how important the bioremediation technique is which is so much eco friendly and which is the this is the current trend and this is going to be the future and the most relying technique that we can uh, use in restoring the degraded ecosystems uh, for on earth thank you thank you so much sir and i think now okay yeah, yeah thank Someone you has also uh, yes sir so if you want you can uh, mail your questions also to us uh, sir there is one more question if you want we can take yeah i i like she says, "Can't we can't we harvest those viruses in the lab?" See, in, in, in the sense, what I want to say is, we need to isolate from the nature. You can multiply in number, just like bacteria. You need to multiply in lab, and then you can take it back to the nature. So that's how the, for any micro we do it. But it's a very important question. You're right. But we don't engineer it. We, we don't want to engineer it once we introduce it, because we want to learn from the nature. So whatever nature has selected in the in, in the field. So we try to identify those useful uh, viruses and then we multiply in the lab and then we introduce. 
but good yeah it's a good question so thank you again so thank you, thank i you. must thank once again to all in the ip college so thank you very much so nice thank you Bye. sir thank you so much sir so uh thank you everyone uh, the uh, i have to make i just want to make one announcement here we have uploaded the assignment of the second week on the website please kindly do uh, try to submit it on time and i hope all of you not all of you have done it please try to submit the assignments on time it would be good for you and tomorrow we are going to have uh, the lecture in the the next lecture would be by dr chira shrigo she is the associate ca professor uh, from uh, in the department of environmental studies university of delhi she is doing she has a vast experience in the field of air pollution so she'll be delivering the lecture on the air pollution so please be there and uh, keep a tab on the website as well no 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 it's okay uh, so no we'll not be giving you the marks uh, we will uh, try to submit all the assignments first and you'll be knowing about everything we'll not be giving you marks don't worry so we'll be giving you the certificate on the basis of that so uh, thank you so much so keep a tab and if you have any doubt or uh, anything if you want to ask you can ask it to me right now or if you want anything to write to us you can anytime contact us on our mail ids that we have given on the website so if you have any doubt or any question regarding anything you can ask right to me right time it is the right time to ask me no theek hai see you tomorrow thank you so much tomorrow we will be listening to dr chira shri ghosh thank you so much okay okay fine we'll let you know we'll let you know thank you